This regular meeting of the Judson Board of, Board of Trustees is hereby called to order at 7 p.m. I'm very pleased that you've taken time to join us this evening. As the Judson Board of Trustees, we are here to set goals and policies and oversee the management of the district. We are responsible for approving budgets, contracts, personnel appointments, and to listen to reports from the superintendent. We are not here to make administrative or management decisions pertaining to the daily operations of the district. This is the responsibility of the superintendent. In compliance with the state government code on open meetings, tonight's agenda has been appropriately posted. This is a meeting in public, not a meeting of the public. As our guests, you are welcome to observe and listen. These proceedings are being video and audio recorded and will become part of Judson's permanent legal record. In order that the tape adequately reflect, reflects these proceedings, please silence your mobile devices and refrain from talking while others are speaking. Since it is legally mandated that these proceedings are recorded accurately, I may have to ask for order periodically should I notice that disruptions are interfering with our recording capabilities. Once again, I extend to each of you a sincere welcome from the entire school board. Thank you for your interest in Judson ISD. We have established a quorum and I will call roll and as I call roll, if you'll, you'll please mark it electronically, that you're present. Um, we will start with Mr. LaFoyle. Present. Ms. Kenoyer. Present. Mr. Macias. Uh, good evening and present. Ms. Pichel. Present, good evening, thank you for being here. Ms. Rodriguez. Present, welcome. For the record, Ms. Eaton is not here this, not tonight, and I am Melinda Salinas. Thank you so much for being here. To my left, we have our superintendent of schools, Dr. Carl Montoya. Present. Dr. Montoya, would you like to introduce your cabinet? Let me uh, go around, starting on my left, uh, okay. our very important person, Betty Holmes, board secretary. <laughs> Dr. Fields, Assistant Superintendent of Operations, Mr. Marco Garcia, Chief Human Resources Officer, Mr. Jose Elizondo, the Chief Financial Officer, uh, Ms. Cecilia Davis, Executive Director of Curriculum Instruction, Dr. Nelly Cantu, which handles all of our post high school and career areas, Ms. Elida Berra, Deputy Superintendent, and Mr. Steve Linscombe at the podium, who's our public information officer. Thank you. If you'll please rise for invocation and Pledge of Allegiance. Please bow your head. Lord, we thank you for all the gifts that you have given our students, our parents, and our staff. But we also ask that during these difficult times in terms of some of the violence that has occurred in schools and communities that you intervene and that you do something to help us that these things stop and that people realize there's a better way to deal with problems and issues than what some people have had in their mind thought they had to do so we ask that you keep that in your heart and your mind as you help us we also ask that you take care of our students and staff for the rest of the year and that everyone here get home safely this evening we pray in your name amen I'd like to introduce to you our pledge leader for tonight. He is Preston Young. Preston, come on up to the microphone there. He has attended Woodlake Elementary School from kindergarten to fifth grade, and he has three brothers, age, five, uh, age eight, nine, and 16 years old. Preston is an AB honor roll student and has been a Boy Scout for the last four years and has perfect attendance at Woodlake since he started in kindergarten. <laughs> Preston uh, is a good role model at school, obviously, willing to help in any kind of situation. He aspires to go into the field of engineering, but right now he enjoys animals and the outdoors. Let's join Preston in the Pledge of Allegiance to the U.S. and Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And now for the Texas Pledge. 
honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state under God, one and invisible. You may be seated. Let's give Preston a hand for a nice job. And uh, I believe his, his mom is uh, <laughs> sitting right here. <laughs> sure, sure. By the way, his mom is also a teacher. So. Yes, I'm also a teacher. <laughs> All right, I'd like to recognize our color guard for this evening, coming from Judson High School, Junior ROTC. Cadet First Lieutenant Yahira Jones, Cadet Captain Daniel Sandoval, Cadet Senior Airman Yasmin Hilliard, and Cadet Airman First Class Chase Buck. All right, our first recognition this evening comes from Judson High School. This student is a member of the Judson High School Band and was selected as a member of the prestigious Texas Music Educators Association All-State Band. He was chosen for uh, this great honor through a competitive process held this year across the state, the region, and area levels. As a part of this honor, this uh, student performed at the TMEA Clinic Convention at San Antonio's Henry B. Gonzalez Convention Center this past February. Please congratulate Alex Gutierrez. <laughs> Alex plays clarinet at school under the direction of Jeffrey Keyes, director of bands at Judson. 
Uh, this is uh, Alex's second time to be chosen to be a member of this Texas Music Educators Association All-State Band Organization. Uh, and Alex is the son of Joe and Estela Gutierrez. And I believe that is his mother right here, correct? <laughs> All right, our second recognition comes also from Judson High School. Uh, you probably heard about the tremendous success that our girls' basketball programs in the district have been seeing lately. The uh, Judson High School Lady Rockets went all the way to the state final and lost a tough close game, Plano 62 to 58. Uh, their record of 34 wins and five losses is a testimony to their commitment and ability to work as a team for a goal bigger than themselves. I'd like to introduce to you the team members as they, uh, as they come through here. Sophomore Tiana Huggins, junior Karina Carter, senior Victoria Yay! Gonzalez. Kianale Ukuso, Heaven Mubarak, Olivia Flowers, Nemea Barnett, Tiffany McGarity, Kira White, Gabriella Patterson, Desiree Lewis, Zia Brown, and Kiara Sanderlin. Assistant coaches are Tasha Kennedy, Tamara Toru, Nia Toru, and of course the head coach, Triva Corrales. Now, will all the parents, if you're not taking pictures, if you're not, uh, if, if, if all of you would stand up, please, and be recognized. Yay. Thank you, ladies. Now, as they as they exit. Uh, as they exit, I also want to uh, tell you, you probably know that not only did the Lady Rockets make the 6A final, but the Lady Patriots of Veterans Memorial High School yeah. made it to the 4A final as well. Yeah. Unfortunately, m uh, many of those team members could not make it this month because of track meet obligations. Uh, so we are hoping that they'll make it for next month's meeting. So thank you very much. Those are the recognitions for this evening. This time, we're now going to move on to acknowledgement of citizens to be heard. This time is provided for citizens to address the board on issues or concerns. A person may speak one time for a period of three minutes. Presentation shall be informative only. No board action will be taken. A complaint or charge against an officer or employee of the district is not allowed in open session. 
Complaints and concerns should first be addressed by campus and or district administration. If your topic involves a personnel matter, a student matter, or if you contend that your legal rights have been violated or board policy not followed, we have specific grievance procedures, DGBA legal and local for these matters, and now is not the appropriate time to discuss these matters. Also, as a reminder, you are not allowed to refer to any individual by name. We respectfully ask that you refrain from making personal attacks or rude or slanderous remarks or becoming boisterous. The presiding officer shall determine whether a person who wishes to address the board has attempted to solve a matter administratively. If not, the person shall be directed to the appropriate policy to seek resolution before bringing the matter to the board at a subsequent meeting. Citizens wishing to receive a response from concerns presented to the board must provide written documentation. The board shall not deliberate or decide regarding any subject that is not included on the agenda posted with notice of the meeting. First person or persons is um, Katrina Blake and Christopher Blake. And the agenda item to be discussed is active shooter defense situation. Good evening, board members, Dr. Montoya, and guests. I'm Katarina Blake, and I attend Judson Early College Academy. I am Christopher Blake, and I attend the JSTEM Academy. On February 24th, my brother and I attended a seminar brought on by Pete Hardy, the owner of two Krav Maga gyms, and former San Antonio police officer Rick Smith. The purpose of this seminar was to teach us what to do in an active shooter situation. Currently, what students are instructed to do during an active shooter situation is ineffective. One major problem schools have in active shooter situations is an inability to stop the shooter. According to the Department of Homeland Security, the average school shooting is over in 12 and a half minutes. Mm -hmm. The average police response time is 18 minutes. By the time police are able to get to the shooting incident, it will be too late to save lives of students. One solution is to stop the shooter as quickly as possible. Some ways to help do this are to arm teachers and give teachers the sort of training we received in the seminar. In order to stop the shooter, we need to be able to disarm and subdue the shooter. One easy and effective method is to use fire extinguishers and spray the suppressant on the shooter, thus choking them. So far, the only classrooms in schools that have fire extinguishers are the science classrooms. If fire extinguishers were to be installed in all of the classrooms, this, was, this would greatly enhance students' and faculty chances for survival. The people who run these classes are willing to come to schools and teach faculty and staff how to overpower a shooter if the shooter comes into the classroom. At this seminar, we were taught how to surprise the shooter, take the gun from the shooter, and then use the weapon to subdue the shooter. Pete Hardy, the man who owns the Krav Maga gym and who leads the course, offered to teach administrators and faculty, faculty these skills at no cost to the district. We need this sort of training for students, teachers, and administrators of the district. This is training that can and will save lives if one of these tragedies does happen in our district. We must be prepared. We need to know how to stop the killing before it happens. In lockdowns, we are taught to hide behind desks, hide around the room, and nobody goes in or out of the school buildings. In an active shooter situa situation with automatic weapons, as seen in other situations, hiding behind desks will not do anything, and students and staff will not be safe hiding around the room or hiding underneath desks. I we have flyers to pass around that have the number for the Krav Maga gym. We hope the district will call Mr. Hardy and arrange for this free training for anyone who wishes to take it. Thank you for your time, and we hope you all have a pleasant evening. Thank you. They did a great job. Scott, great job. Next is Beverly Chaffee, and the agenda item to be discussed is Jekka Principal. Thank you so much. Good evening. I am Beverly Chaffee, and I have put not only children, but grandchildren 
through the Judson Independent School District. In my time doing this, interacting with many different administrators, I have found the administrator uh, of the Jekka School to be one, if not the best, that I have ever encountered. Rather, I have called him from middle school to Jekka to talk about how wonderful a teacher has been, or if we're having an issue with the teacher. He seems to just know when to step in and when to let a problem solve itself. He has, I believe, a God-given love and talent to be an administrator with children. And I believe that all of us, none of us live in glass houses that can say, We've never had a personal situation that we don't look back on and think, I wish I had handled this differently. But knowing that principle, as I do and having interacted with him, I also believe that what he has been through is going to make him a stronger and better role model for our children. The loss of this particular man would be a great loss for our children. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Armando Gonzalez, and the agenda item to be discussed is school resource officer at JECA and active shooter response training for students and staff. Good morning. Oh, good morning. Good, good evening, <laughs> board members. Uh, my name is Armando Gonzalez, and I'm a parent of a Jekka student. Um, I work at another school district, uh, Seguin, and I would love to see a school resource officer at Jekka, as they don't have one currently. Uh, and as far as um, piggybacking on what the young lady and young man said regarding active school shooters, uh, at Seguin, we um, do what we call the ALICE training, and we're one of the, I think, the first district where we've uh, done online for our students, and then the whole te the whole district as a whole regarding uh, what to do on an active uh, shooter situation. And basically, uh, first, run, get out of there. Secondly, uh, lock down, barricade, and then lastly, counter, defend yourself. Um, this uh, 1950s bomb shelter mentality that we have and practices that we do just aren't cutting it. Uh, we need to get it more update with the times and uh, take care of our uh, children. And then lastly, uh, I'm also here in uh, full support of the uh, Jekka principal as well, please. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Wendy Marbach, and the agenda item to be discussed is Jekka Principal. Good evening. Myself, Mr. Scott, and Ms. Taylor and a host of um, JECA staff, thank you for allowing me to speak to you t t tonight in behalf of the students, faculty, and parents of the Judson Early Collie Academy. Tonight, I feel compelled to speak to you because of the future of a good man that lies in your hands. Our principal is a leader, a mentor, and a friend. Martin Luther King once said, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. It is because of this man matters to us, the staff, the students, and parents of Judson Early College Academy that I am addressing you tonight. Our principal has come to personify the very heart and soul of Jekka. This school has been a safe haven for students that are unique in personality, talent, and emotion. This is a place where kids that are facing challenges at home and who may not receive the love and attention that they need are welcomed they will have that void filled at Jekka. 
in a large part due to our principal, students that would get lost in the sheer masses of traditional high schools thrive at JECA. It's, since its establishment nine years ago, JECA has been misunderstood by naysayers who have not yet th crossed its threshold. Behind these walls, these loving walls, he has built the structure that we use to shape, mold, and cultivate our students into productive, contributing members of society. We love these students, and when we are finished with them, yes, they become the cream of the crop. Our principal has taught this staff and that body of students to be accepting and tolerant of whatever the world throws our way. Using his love and logic, he has reassured many students that were ready to give up due to a failing grade or a broken friendship that all is not lost. For students who believe that because of a failing grade or class that they will be dismissed from JECA to their home campuses, our principal's response to them is, this is your home, you aren't going anywhere, you will always be a raptor. Since our principal's unfortunate event, this school has been inundated with calls from parents who want to help. Can we hire him an attorney, they ask? Can we have a fundraiser or start a GoFundMe on his behalf? The list goes on and on. Just the other day, a group of parents came into my office and said, we would like to see him come back and use this as a teaching moment. These parents stand behind Mr. McFalls, I'm sorry, as do we all. He will always be a raptor. One thing that we need to remember is that the incident did not happen on school grounds. Yet it has been sensationalized and he has been tried and convicted through the media. And what he did was on his own time. He didn't harm anyone. He didn't involve any students or teachers or any illicit act. He didn't change any grades in behalf of any students or get them undeserved scholarships. Our students work hard to earn the accolades that they receive. The students here are successful and earn what they receive, yet his mistake has been unfairly broadcasted. The atmosphere at JECA feels like a death in our family. Some students walk around sad and somber, others angry and are acting out. These students thrive on his energy. They are used to seeing him in front of the school greeting all 469 students. Thank you, ma'am. Next, we have Carolyn Montgomery Harrison. An agenda item to be discussed is Jekka Principal. Good evening. My name is Carolyn Montgomery Harrison. I'm a retired teacher with the Judson District. I am also a supporter of the Judson Principal. As you know, he has an incredible history of success with our district. His expectations for students and staff are high. His ability, to, I'm going to cry. His ability to create change through a positive school culture is clearly evident. He has made such a positive impact on so many lives, not only students and teachers, but on future administrators. He has mentored during his 16 years with the district. He embodies the character traits that make principals successful. High energy, trustworthiness, honesty, optimism, determination, but above all, his personal integrity is its most valuable asset. He has poured his heart and soul into the three schools he has led. Each one of these campuses has dramatically improved due to his guidance. I am saddened to think that due to one era of ju judgment, there will be students who will not have an opportunity to benefit from his guidance and experience his leadership. I pray that the Judson District recognizes the impact, the influence, the inspiration that he clearly has demonstrated. He has so much more to achieve and has the ability to translate vision for students into reality. It seems to me that the Judson District would not want to lose such talent. Can't we use this situation as a teachable moment for our students, showing them that no mistake is too big for forgiveness and that by taking the high road and extending a second chance to a person, the honorable thing to do. Thank you. Thank you. 
Next, we have Ricky Brown, and the agenda item to be discussed is JECA principal. Good afternoon, and thank you for having me. I'm here also in support of the uh, JECA administrator. Prior to him being a raptor, he was a flyer. And when he came to our school, and he was there for, uh, I think it was five years with him. During that time, I observed a man that was deeply concerned about the faculty, staff, and most importantly, the students that we were entrusted to educate. In fact, before he arrived, we believed that as a campus, we were doing a very good job, and we were. But he made us better. Under his leadership, our star, CBA scores, community involvement, morale, and various other assessments improved. What he did was he raised the bar, and we met the challenge. He would frequently say at faculty meetings that Kitty Hawk was the flagship of the district. And I would most of the time chuckle because I'm a former Marine, and I spent some time on Navy ships. And I was on a flagship, and it was definitely not like Kitty Hawk. <laughs> So I, I understood the concept he was saying, but I was like, okay, we are the flagship. <laughs> so as I look around the room, and I'm sure all of you, including me, have made some choices during our lifetime that if given a second chance, we would do differently. I'm not disregarding or making light of the seriousness of why we are here, because there are always consequences for our actions or lack of actions. It's called responsibility. However, to my knowledge, there was no loss of life, thank God, no serious bodily injuries or expensive property damage. He is a fair and honorable man that has invested many years of hard work and dedication to the Judson Independent School District. In closing, I ask that you look at him from a holistic point of view, and you will discover what I and numerous others already know, that his strong leadership qualities, his positive attributes, significantly outweigh this moment of lapse, basically a lapse of judgment. Everyone, and I think someone else has already stated this, deserves a second chance. I think prior to spring break, one of the things on our campus was showing acts of kindness, and we had basically a theme for every day that week. And if we're truly honest with ourselves, some of us need a second chance. And some of us sometimes may need three or four. The point being is that he has a good heart and he wants to do what's right and he just made an honest mistake. And I think again, we've all have made those and we can all li live and learn from those experiences. Thank you for having me and have a good evening. Thank you. Next, we have Thomas Daly, and the agenda item to be discussed is Jekka Principal. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen of the board. My name is Thomas Daly, and I am a current junior at, uh, excuse me, mm, at uh, just another college academy. Now, it's emotional here because I've known this, this man for about six years of my life, right? Since uh, sixth grade. Mm -hmm. um, he has been an extremely uh, positive and um, influential figure in my life. He's like a second father to me, kind of. Always points me in the right direction. Um, he always gives me the, great, the greatest advice I could ever ask for. And um, uh, me and him always have this, uh, this, uh, this thing at Jekka. I'm um, still learning the ways of being a, a southern gentleman. So uh, I, I accidentally uh, wear my cowboy hat inside, and he comes by behind me out of nowhere and says, the hat's not allowed in the building. That's not how a cowboy dresses. <laughs> so uh, by doing that, just the little things in life, they, uh, they allow me to be a better man in general. And um, he is honestly the only principal that I've seen that has taken the time and impacted every student. 
adjunct of he has gotten to learn the names of each 469 student at Jekyll, first and last name, even the ones that haven't even come in yet, just to make them feel like they're at home. Waits at the front door and greets them every single day with a handshake or a hug, saying, welcome back, and I hope you have a great day. Um, and to be quite honest, without him there, it's just not the same. He is the captain to our ship, and he guides us in the correct direction, no matter how difficult. And without him, we're just going into a typhoon, kind of. So, um, especially since uh, I expect him to be there to give me my diploma next year as a senior on that stage. Um, and we all make mistakes. Um, and it's kind of sad in today's society that uh, no matter how many good things we do for people, that the world always tends to uh, get us for that one bad mistake. Because he has done so, so many good things. He stood up for Jekka and trying to get us the things that we need. So. This man deserves a second chance if not anyone, above everyone. He is an extremely great role model, and he needs to come back and continue leading us in the, dire in the correct direction so that we can finally be the future, um, the future of this world. Thank you, have a good night. Next, we have Savannah Mayhood, and the agenda item to be discussed is Jekka Principal. I'm a little short. Um, good evening. My name is Savannah Mayhood, and I am a current senior at Judson Early College Academy. I have known this principal for 10 years of my life, since I was in second grade at Miller's Point Elementary, through fourth grade, and then sixth grade through eighth grade at Kitty Hawk, and now since my sophomore year to my senior year. This man not only has been a role model for me, but he's been there for my entire family. We have sent all four of us, all of the kids, we've sent them all through the Judson District, and this man, has constantly made sure that he keeps in touch with us and he keeps updated with anything that's going on. This past um, spring and fall, I competed in the Boys and Girls Club Youth of the Year competition and I was named San Antonio Youth of the Year. He was the one who was constantly checking in during the competition and making sure that I was doing what I needed to do and he sent in the little bio and the picture in order for me to be on the district website because he was so overjoyed and proud of me, of this accomplishment. Recently, this past spring, um, some news has come out about the sexual abuse that I endured from my stepfather. When that happened, authorities came to Jekka and talked to me there, and I was an emotional wreck. And he sat in that counselor's office with me and held me while I cried and told me, if you need anything, I am here. If you need any words of encouragement, whether it be to get through your classes or to get through the emotional stress that you are under, I am here. Not only did he tell me that, he told my mother that. And this man, he has guided us through so many things. I look forward to going and seeing him at school every day and challenging him to a game of ping pong every once in a while. But most importantly, this man has seen me grow up. He's seen me grow into the woman that I am now. And I was looking forward to having him hand me my diploma when I walked the stage in May and being able to shake his hand and thank him for everything that he has done for me and for my family. I'm sorry. He is, this is a lapse in judgment, yes. But I have learned from this, my, you know, I have gone and talked to him about the things that I have endured and he has given me the best possible advice that I could ask for, whether it be with friendships or with school because of the stressful professors and with anything that I have struggled with, he has been there no matter what. He is the backbone to Jekka. When he came my sophomore year, 
everything changed. It was a more pleasant environment, and I wish for it to continue to be so. Thank you. We'll move on to item four, consideration of consent items. Please let me know if you'd like an item pulled. 4A, consider and take action regarding approving minutes from the regular board meeting held on February 15th and the special meeting held on February 26, 2018. 4B, consider and take action regarding approving monthly financial information as of February 28th, 2018. Cool. 4C, consider and take action regarding approving of expenditures equal to or greater than $50,000. 4D, consider and take action regarding approving budget transfers across functions. 4E, consider and take action regarding approving the submittal for request for proposal 17-35 for general and instructional supplies. 4F, consider and take action regarding approving the ranking of submittals for request for proposals 18-16 Grease trap cleaning. 4G, consider and take action regarding approving the ranking of the submittals for request for proposal 18-17 HVAC filters. 4H, consider and take action regarding approving the instructional materials allotment and TEAK certification. 4I, consider and take action regarding approving the second reading of DEC local, compensation and benefits, leaves and absences. 4J, consider and take action regarding approving the 2018-2019 Application for Staff Development Minutes Waiver. 4K, consider and take action regarding approving a proclamation declaring April 16th through April 20th, 2018 as Judson ISD Assistant Principals Week. 4L, consider and take action regarding approving a proclamation declaring April as Judson ISD Month of the Military Child. 4. Yes, I will read all both proclamations, yes. If there are no, we will proceed to vote. We're going to vote on 4A, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, and L. Do I have a motion? Motion. Motion, Mr. Macias, second, Mr. LaFoyle, if you'll please proceed to vote. Motions carry six to zero. We will go back to item 4B, consider and take action regarding approving monthly financial information as of February 28th, 2018. Mr. Macias. Yes, ma'am. I, um, Dr. Matoya, just would like some information on, I guess, two of our um, vendors. Uh, I'd like to know a little more about what they're doing, um, and obviously you can provide this to the entire board, but have a, a little bit more uh, understanding of what ImageNet Consulting, uh, there was a $45,000 expenditure for them, so I just would like to know more or less what, what they're doing for us. Uh, it doesn't have to be now, just, just you okay. can get that to us. Okay. And secondly, uh, School Links Inc. In terms okay. of the college and career readiness software platform licenses, I, I just would like to have a better understanding of the, those expenditures. If it's one time and this is it for the year, or, or what that looks okay. like. Uh, Mr. Alessandro, why don't we get our purchasing director to put something together, and we can send it to the whole board, and you know, within a few days, yes, explaining sir. that. So. Is there any further discussion? Okay, we'll proceed to vote. Oh, thank second. you. Sorry, I apologize. Thank you, Ms. Knoyer. Motion, Ms. Knoyer. Second, Ms. Bichon. Motion carries six to zero. Four K. Consider and take action regarding approving a proclamation declaring April sixteenth through April twentieth, twenty eighteen, as Judson ISD Assistant Principals Week. Motion, Motion Mr. Macias. Second, Ms. Knoyer. Mr. Macias. Yes, I, um, I appreciate the recognition for um, declaring um, 
the 16th of April through the 20th as Assistance Principals Week. That's okay. You can still. We can still, <laughs> still proceed. Yeah. Yeah. So what I'd like to know is if there's a um, a, a standard protocol for these proclamations. We've been doing a great deal of them, and uh, I will tell you the the. Uh, just want to know if there is one, what that plan is, yeah. uh, and, and is it a template? Okay. Do we follow uh, this plan? Ms. Barrow, if you'd like to cover yes. that topic. Yes, uh, there is, uh, Mr. Macias. It's a, national, it's a national recognition. We've never really done it at Judson, but uh, we are starting this year, and we are following the national uh, protocol for recognizing assistant principals. So what would that look like? It, we have different events. Uh, we are really trying to keep the events so that uh, they are positive and stay within the school hours. And uh, most of them are just recognizing the principals, making sure, assistant principals, making sure that the students do little banners for them as well, but uh, nothing major for them. Well, and the reason why I pulled this item as well is because, again, we have been putting proclamations, it looks like, on every other meeting and um, ensuring that we're maximizing, and it's just not just words. I mean, there's actually some depth behind why we're doing the recognition. And if we have a template that's formed that it, whenever we do this, there's A, B, C, and D that we need to do. Uh, if it's a district function, if it's an ice cream social, if it's a, I don't know, something that just makes sense. I mean, that might be applicable. And um, that way there's a checklist. We do have a checklist. I can, I can share that with you of the different events that are recommended at the national level. Uh, and I will tell you that uh, as a cabinet, we kind of th talked about that as well, about whether or not we really needed to have an assistant principal's recognition. But I think in the end, we realized that they do play a valuable role, and that was the reason that we went, we moved forward with it. Well, I like it. Again, there's no, there's no concern on my end on that. It's just maximizing our opportunity as we recognize that with a, a plan. Um, so it doesn't go past and we didn't do anything. Which again, I know we are, but but I like to know that that would be standard for all of the events that we have proclamations. With. I will bring that up with our cabinet to come up with a format for any other future proclamations that we bring to the board. Thank you. Is there any further discussion? We'll proceed to vote. Motion carries six to zero and I'll read the proclamation. Week of the Assistant Principal Proclamation. Whereas campus leadership matters for the Judson Independent School District's public education system and more than 23,000 students it serves. And whereas Judson ISD values the role of the assistant principal and, and seeks to hire assistant principals who are passionate lifelong learners who believe in forming a safe quality public education. And whereas the, t the title assistant principal is a term used to define a campus leader who works collaboratively alongside the campus principal, fellow assistant principals, and staff to promote an effective and efficient public education for all students for the purpose of improving student achievement. And whereas Judson ISD recognizes that the pathway of an assistant principal from classroom teacher to campus leader is beneficial to their role to effectively and efficiently lead a campus and improve student achievement. And whereas research shows that effective assistant principals seek to set high expectations for academic achievement and a relentless resolve for building a culture of continuous learning and for faculty and staff. And whereas assistant principals uphold local and legal policies that govern students, personnel, operations and facilities, budgeting, community relations, curriculum, instruction and assessment to ensure fair and consistent interactions with stakeholders. And whereas assistant principals routinely depend on a network of support from school communities, fellow administrators, teachers, parents, students, businesses, community members, board trustees, colleges and universities, community and faith-based organizations, elected officials, and district and county staff and resources to promote ongoing student achievement and school success. Now, therefore, I, Melinda Salinas, board president of Judson ISD, do hereby proclaim April 16th through April 20th, 2018, as Assistant Principals Week in the Judson Independent School District and urge all citizens to recognize the importance of assistant principals at all grade levels to the success of students in Judson ISD and ensuring that every child has access to a quality education.
And next, I'll read the proclamation for April 2018 for the month of the military child. Whereas since 1986, military installations around the world have celebrated the month of the military child through the, throughout the month of April, recognizing the sacrifices and applauding the courage of military children. Whereas Judson Independent School District recognizes each day military children experience unique challenges which they face with resilience and dignity beyond their years. And whereas it is essential for Judson ISD to recognize that military children do make a significant contribution to our nation to our national, I'm sorry, to our nation through understanding and supporting their military parents who often work long hours and make numerous deployments when called upon. And whereas Judson Independent School District is honored to work with the military connected students and families to provide support to our children of service members as they transition between schools to address their distinct needs and prepare them to graduate as well-rounded citizens ready for college and career. And whereas Judson ISD recognizes the physical, social, and emotional well-being of children in military families is essential to their success and has a direct impact on the resiliency of military families serving our country. And whereas Judson Independent School District will ensure military children are safe and supported in our schools and communities, our men and women in uniform can, fo can focus on the challenges and missions they face in the line of duty. And whereas Judson Independent School District efforts and support can improve the lives of military youth and help pave the way for future generations. Now, therefore, I, Melinda Salinas, Board President of Judson ISD, therefore be it resolved, April 2018, be proclaimed as the month of the military child. I urge all Judson Independent School District faculty and staff to hereby join the nation in recognizing the important contributions and sacrifices our military children make as we honor them throughout the month of April. I encourage schools to plan special events to honor military children and have administrators and principals incorporate the themes of this month into their everyday duties and responsibilities. And purple up for military kids. Judson Independent School District has designated Friday, April 13th, 2018 as purple up for military kids and call on all the district staff to join me in honoring military children by wearing purple on this day and urge all to observe this month by connecting the military youth, military families, and communities to provide support to all military children. The color purple is chosen because it represents the combined colors of all the branches of the military, Army Green, Coast Guard Blue, Air Force Blue, Marine Red, and Navy Blue. In testimony whereof, I have hereunto set my hand and caused to the affixed the great seal of the Judson Independent School District this 20... Second day of March, 2018. Okay, we will move on to five, discussion and consideration of action items. 5A, consideration and take possible action regarding approval of the district attendance lines for Escondido North and Wortham Oaks Elementary Schools. Do I have a motion? Second. Motion, Mr. Macias. Second, Ms. Pichel. Discussion. Ms. Pichel. Thank you, Dr. Salinas. Um, Dr. Montoya, I would like to get some clarity on what it means, these, these SR05, SR08, what does that mean? for each of those elementary schools. For um, Escondido North, there's SR05. Okay, uh, Dr. Fields, if you want to share the, what that exactly means. Yes, sir. In our PEAMS recording for Escondido Creek, it's, lo it's uh, registered as SR05. And then for Escondido Meadows, it's SR08. And for every community within the district, there's a So that's a PEAMS code, yes, PEAMS I see. Yeah. It's a neighborhood code. A neighborhood code, okay. Yes, and so um, that just means that those are the schools that are affected. Yes, the, the, the those communities. Yes. Communities that are affected. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, sir. That's yes, all. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Macias? Yes, um, Dr. Matoya. Um, there, um, in the memorandum that was provided in the board book, uh, there's um, no indication of what the um, alleviation of the uh, enrollment would do at most masters and at Rolling Oaks. I believe we've probably discussed it at prior meetings, but just for my own sake of understanding, 
this realignment, can you give me real numbers on what that projected enrollment would now be at Masters and what it would look like also at, at uh, Rolling Oaks? Yeah, uh, Dr. Yes, Fields, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Um, last meeting, we did go over that um, at Masters Elementary, they're currently over 800. It would change the numbers for Escondido North with how we've drawn um, drawn it out to 445 for Escondido North and um, 341 for James Masters. We also talked about last meeting how the growth around the Masters area is tremendous. So we're trying to make room for those areas that are coming in and we have it outlined on the uh, sheet. And then for Wortham Oaks, it's really hard because uh, Dr. Montoya and I drove up to Wortham Oaks Elementary today. There are so many areas that are starting to build communities. I think the one we looked at today was Winding. I can't remember what the, the Winding Oaks, I think. But it's a huge area building a bunch of houses, and there's going to be a lot of students going in. The way that we've drawn it, it would take uh, Rolling Meadows Elementary from the 940 that they're currently at down to about 740 and then take about 200 students directly over. But if we pull the bilingual program from Crestview of those students, it would probably increase them to almost 300 to start. We're the most elementary. Well, that's good. And I know that we did discuss it, but just in case there's any changes Understood. or whatnot, we were 30 days further ahead. So just so I can understand, Masters will looks like it will be significantly impacted. You're talking almost 60% of the student population will be going over to uh, Escondido North. Yes, sir. Does that, that sound correct? Yes, sir. Okay, so obviously that changes staffing allocation and all kinds of stuff there correct. at the campus. Okay. And then also under the plan, you, there is a, a no grandfathering clause. Um, what are some of the things that, just to anticipate, that parents may ask for um, grandfathering that you may have seen uh, in, in your experience? What is it siblings being at one campus? What, what kind of things will we be potentially looking at? Well, typically in the past when we've drawn out boundary lines, we've allowed students that wanted to remain at their current location to continue to go to that school. One of the recent examples would be Veterans Memorial versus Jetson High School. Mm -hmm. A lot of those students that live in the Veterans Memorial boundary lines are still going to Jetson High School because we grandfathered them in. In this particular case, once we draw these lines, the students that are over at Escondido, we would then move over to um, um, yes, over to Escondido North Elementary and then only allow the students that are in the current master's uh, boundary lines to stay because that way we can even out those schools and then allow the students to come in. The reason why we do that a little bit differently at the secondary level is because once a person starts off as a rocket, they don't necessarily want to graduate as a patriot. Um, but at the elementary level, we're just moving students around if that's not too and, and I understand that, but the question was, what would be some of the reasons we would anticipate anyone wanting to be grandfathered? Are we not anticipating, because this is pretty clear on the memorandum, no grandfathering. It, it gives me the impression that there's an anticipation that parents are going to say, I want to stay at this school. So well, I just want to kind of get an understanding of what some of those reasons would be for parents not wanting to be realigned, because that's what we're going to hear from the community. So g give me some examples of why would somebody want to be grandfathered at the elementary level? I, would, I, I can only hazard a guess, but I would assume that for a student who has lived in this Escondido North area and has gone to Masters Elementary since kindergarten and is now in the fourth grade getting ready to go into the fifth grade in their last year at Masters Elementary, you'll now be moved over to Escondido North to finish out your fifth grade level. I can see a student like that saying, I've been here for five years already. Okay. But, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to... No, no, I, I'm just kind of... I, mean, I want to know what that might look like, but also, uh, could it be geography? Could we be realigning somebody who is literally across the street from Masters, but the alignment now puts them somewhere else? We shouldn't see that scenario then. No, sir. We passed uh, out uh, a, a map last I know, meeting. I know. I just want to hear it that... It shows that all of the individual areas that are going to report to Escondido North are in that particular area. Matter of fact, um, you would cross Ben's Engelman to the Glenlock Farms area, but as soon as you go past that, getting closer to the new areas that they're building up, all of those would go back to Masters. So we wouldn't have that issue no, at all? Not That's at all. what I wanted to hear. Thank you. Yes, sir. Ms. Rodriguez. 
Um, my question, um, I was going to ask about the grandfathering. Um, my question was about the waivers. How many, um, when we've done, how, I, I'm not sure if we've done this in the past with elementary where we haven't grandfathered. So um, I'm wondering how many waivers we've gotten in the past if we've done a plan like this and how many we might anticipate. I, I can tell you, could you, I can tell you since I've been here, I wasn't here when they opened up Copperfield. I don't know how many waiver requests they may receive for this particular area, but I know that in the past we've done the no grandfathering clause for all of the elementaries that we've opened up. Yes, ma'am. Well, I need to disregard she asked the question oh. I was going to ask about was a waiver. <laughs> so how do I do that? I oh, okay. take care of it for you. Thanks. Anybody else? Okay, if there's no further discussion, we'll proceed to vote. Motion carries six to zero. And again, board members, we thank you for finishing this because we need to get this information out to parents as quickly as possible because they're going to have to start, uh, you know, looking at what's going to happen to get their child to whichever school they're zoned to, basically. Thank you. We'll move on to item 5B. Consider and take possible action regarding approving the naming of Escondido North and Wortham Oaks Elementary Schools. Do I have a motion? Motion. Second. Motion, Ms. Kenoyer. Second, Ms. Fischel. Discussion. Ms. Fischel. I'm always trying to follow protocol and wait for somebody else. Somebody else to yeah to give me the floor. But okay, Dr. Montoya. Um, just clarification. At any time, a, the community wants to. Um, make us a, 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 a nomination for a name of one of our facilities, a renaming, a new name, that at any time, anyone from the community can do that. It doesn't have to be right at the onset that we're construction, constructing the building, correct? Uh, you are correct that, uh, again, the two names that exist right now, Escondido North or Where the Mokes, are the general areas. But in the future, if this board or board members want to revisit that, it's, you know, it can be changed. The reason we need this hopefully approved is because we have to order the signage and a lot of support, uh, the names and the different, it may be in the gym area and a sign out front. And sometimes it takes time from the construction company to get those on order and brought over and installed. So that, that's basically it. True. However, the construction is not held up just because of no, okay. no, no because that's not, the no, way it's no, written. No, it's it's not it's not held up. It, the the construction's not held up because of the name of the school. No, it just helps the district to know and be able to relate yes, to that. Okay, correct. but in the event later on down the line, somebody comes and wants to rename either one of those new schools, it can still happen. It can still happen in the future. Correct. So what would be the expense? of having to change from Escondido North to a name that the board would choose to. I don't know, Dr. Fields, if you, is there an estimate, approximate? I know that signage and other things have to be ordered and put in place, but what, what would be an estimate on something Definitely. like that? I, I would say that we recently changed the name of Veterans Memorial High School. It wouldn't be that extensive. We don't have to take any names off a of basketball court or convert anything like that. We would simply take the markers off the front of the building. Now, once we get into this and you have letterhead printed up and people start to create things, then it becomes more expensive as you move down the road. But currently, it's not a, it's not a real big expense other than changing the names on the outside of the building in a few places on the inside where we do some type of marquee. Thank you, sir. Yes, uh, that's all my questions. Ms. Kenoyer. Thank you. I'm very excited that we're moving forward with naming our new schools. I'm excited to be on a board that's bringing some new campuses online. And I think um, in the past we've had so many schools that are named after neighborhood areas. I think it makes sense in order to identify to the community exactly where the school is located. So I'm a big supporter of the names. Thank you. Thank you. I'm next. 
Um, I know we had talked, or at least I, Dr. Montoya had mentioned that we were um, considering instead of Escondido North, just saying Escondido Elementary. Is that is that what we're proposing here? Definitely, ma'am. Um, okay. Escondido North is really in the south end of the district. Correct. That could get confusing. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. Yeah, we had people getting confused. How can you have the school on the south side when it's called North? You know, yeah. so it, it would be simpler for the community. So this motion is for Escondido and then more the Mokes yes. Elementary School. Yes, ma'am. Okay. okay. So not North. That's not correct. North. That's correct. correct. Okay. Yes, no problem. Any further discussion? If there's the vote is for um, North. Me. Escondido, Escondido. Escondido. And we're the most. Yes. Okay. okay. We will proceed to vote then. Okay. Motion carries six to zero. Next 5C, consider and take possible action regarding approving T-STEM designation renewal for the 2018-2019 school year for Karen Wagner T-STEM Academy and J-STEM Academy. Do I have a motion? Motion. Second. Motion, Mr. Macias. Second, Mr. LaFoyle. Discussion. Okay. Oh, you're trying to push your button. Oh, thank you. Mr. Macias. Um, obviously, um, I personally am a big advocate of the J-STEM and, and T-STEM initiatives. And um, Dr. Montoya, are we going to have um, discussions within our budget cycle that looks at sustainability of the STEM programs? That will be part of the budget process. And as you know, we've had uh, parents asking us what happens after mid-school uh, STEM program, and this allows that opening to proceed from the ninth through the 12th grade. So the answer is yes. Okay, and it will be this budget cycle that we discuss. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Michelle. Well, just out of courtesy and for the sake of the audience, could uh, Dr. Cantu just explain? to them what, what we're talking about. They can't see what we see. Okay, Dr. Cantu, if you want to give them a kind of a brief overview so that the audience knows what we're talking about. Yes, sir. The Texas Education Agency requires that we submit a designation uh, approval so that we can be approved to have a, a T-STEM Academy. Our designation is 612, so that's the reason it includes J-STEM. And what that means is that our students are on a career pathway uh, in the science or engineering pathway. Our partner right now is the University of Texas at Austin, and we're using the UT on-ramps program. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, Dr. Montoya, the JSTEM, is it just to be... I want to clarify. J STEM is remaining at Judson Middle School. That's correct. And then T STEM is staying at Wagner or moving to a new campus? No. Staying at Wagner. At Wagner. It's at Wagner. Okay. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. If there's no further discussion, we'll proceed to vote. Motion carries six to zero. Next item is 5D, consider and take possible action approving a resolution dealing with wage issues involving an inclement weather closing that occurred on January 16th, 2018. Do I have a motion? Motion. Second. second. Motion, Ms. Knoyer, second, Mr. LaFoyle. Discussion. Dr. Montoya, could you explain a little bit? Uh, again, uh, that goes back to a day that the schools were closed because weather was very bad and for safety we closed the schools. The state requires two pieces in this. One is that the students make up the time and that the faculty make up the time. Well, we have enough time, the students have put enough time in, so the students do not have to make up the time for that day. They don't have to come back and, and, and make it up. The issue for us was the staff, and the options literally were to have a, on a day, on a Saturday, 
or add a day possibly at the end of the year, the school year, which might be June. But we also research that if this board passes this, uh, technically this resolution, the possibility does exist that we will not have to make it up with a staff. And, and because, you know, that, that allows us to, that option. Thank you. There's no further discussion. We'll proceed to vote. Motion carries six to zero, and I will read the resolution. <clears throat> Emergency school closing resolution. Whereas the recent inclement weather caused by an ice and snowstorm resulted in the closure of all schools and facilities in the Judson Independent School District, JISD. On January 16th, 2018, due to concerns about the safety of students and staff and the community as a whole. And whereas the board acknowledges that during an emergency closing, most district employees are instructed not to report for work and other employees may be called upon to provide emergency related services or repairs. The board concludes that a need exists to address wage payments for employees who are idle and those required to work during emergency closings. And whereas employees who are instructed not to report to work may suffer a loss of pay unless the workdays are made up at a later date. And whereas the board concludes that continuing wage payments to all employees, contractual and non-contractual, salaried and non-salaried during the emergency closing caused by the ice and snow that occurred on January 16th, 2018, serves the public purposes of maintaining morale, reducing turnover, and ensuring con continuity of district staffing when schools reopen. And whereas as to non-exempt employees who are called on to work during emergency closing, the board further concludes that payment of these employees at a premium rate serves the public purposes of maintaining morale, providing equity between idled employees and employees who provide emergency related services and recognizing the services of essential staff. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Trustees of Judson Independent School District authorizes wage payments to all employees, contractual and non-contractual, salaried and non-salaried, who were instructed not to report to work during this one-day emergency closing. Be it further resolved that non-exempt employees who were required to work during this emer emergency closing shall be paid at the premium rate of one and one-half times their regular rate of pay for all hours worked up to 40 hours per week. Overtime for time worked over 40 hours in a week shall be calculated and paid according to law. The authority granted by this resolution to make wage payments to idled employees and to pay a premium rate to non-exempt employees who were required to report to work is effective for this closure with the maximum duration of one day unless the board takes action to authorize payment for a longer duration. Adopted this 22nd day of March 2018 by the Board of Trustees. Okay, and we will move on to... We will not move on to 5e. E. We will move on to six discussion item and report, superintendent report, construction update. Again, this is a monthly report uh, based on the bond issues that have been passed. Uh, Dr. Fields? Yes, sir. Um, we've, um, we're in the, for the 10 modernizations and improvements where we're looking at the vestibules, we are in the negotiation phase with the architectural company, so we're moving quickly okay. towards getting started with that construction. Um, I also wanted to say for um, phase one of the roofing projects, and we had three, phase one was the critical roofs of Park Village, Wagner, Pashaw, Hopkins, Masters, and Eloff. We're moving really quickly. Park Village is about 60% complete. Wagner's at 70% complete, and it wasn't due for completion until December. For Shaw's at 75% complete. Hopkins at 90%, Masters at 90%, and Eloff at 90% complete. So we're moving quickly towards finishing those roofs and looking at moving into phase two of that uh, insurance project. And all of them are under budget and on time. So. Um, the newly named Escondido Elementary is about 68% complete, where the Mokes is about 21% complete, and it's on time and under budget as well. And at Woodlake Middle School, I know you guys remember we did a lighting retrofit over there, and we're 98% with all of the changes done with the changes over there, but with the lighting retrofit that was done, we've already received, I think it was a $47,000 rebate check from CB CPS for what we've done. Um, that concludes the briefing. Any questions? Thank you, guys. Thank you. We'll move on to 
Item 6B, first reading of EIF Local, Academic Achievement, Graduation. Are there any questions? <laughs> this is just the deletion of the policy. It's in its first reading. Uh, EI, EIF has been uh, deleted. Correct. It can be found in EIE with our graduation pro programs and foundations, foundations with endorsements and distinguished. Thank you. <laughs> 6C, discuss information on last year's star scores with regards to approaching and achieving grade level. At this time, uh, Mrs. Davis, if you'd like to share the information, please. Can I? Oh, here, go ahead. Thank you so much, Ms. Davis. Um, when I asked for this item, it relates back really to another item that the board passed regarding um, maintaining grade level or students on grade level. And so this is very extensive, so thank you to you and your staff for putting all of this together. Um, I really just needed to know or really wanted to know for approaches, meets, and master's grade level, do we know how many third graders, current fourth graders, are, are met, I mean, I'm sorry, we're at approaches grade level, which means, according to the state, that students are likely to succeed in the next grade level or course, but they have to have targeted academic intervention. Do we have, and, and I saw on the first page, but that, that's not just approaches, that's approaches or above. So that looks like it includes all of them and not just approaches, so I was. Uh, oh, okay, may you repeat the question, please? You're looking for just approaches? Well, I just wanted to see if we could see the difference between the third graders, current fourth graders, I'm just starting there, because that's where our star scores start, with how many, what percent or how many were at approaches grade level? What percent met grade level? And then what percent mastered grade level? Yes, ma'am, we can provide that information uh, for you. You're just looking for approaches. No, per, approaches, grade meets, level, because meets if we look at the, the previous um, agenda item that was passed, it would really be meets grade level, where students have a high likelihood of success in the next grade level or course, but still might need some short-term targeted academic intervention. I think that yes, would really be meets grade level, in my opinion, as to the prior discussion that this board has had. Um, yes. And then, so really... But if you could provide all, I know we have all three, and I know I could go look at the TAPR no. report. And some I, of I that, understand. It, yes, ma'am. Some of that information is provided in here. For example, when you are looking at um, index three, it is broken down by approaches, and it is broken down by percent masters on page 127, because it only looks at that. You are correct that when we are looking at um, progress measure, it includes the meet and the exceed. But when you're just looking at approaches, it is just simply that. Those that met the minimum criteria, which the state considers passing or considered passing last year. Correct. But they are still going to need intervention. Correct. For this current upcoming accountability, if the commissioner passes, which he has not yet. Correct. As, as you well know. Um, it looks like he is going to be focusing on not just approaches, but we're going to be raising the bar to meet which still requires, a it, it still has a high likelihood, um, but that student might still require short-term intervention as opposed to a student under approaches that would require long-term intervention. Correct, and so I, I understand the indices, but, but still on index three, you're, we're not showing by grade level. Correct. So we're not showing third grade. And like I said, I know it's on the TAPR report, but I think for us as a board, because of our previous agenda item, it's important for us to know so that as we're looking at even budget for interventions, how many third graders or current fourth graders are, are going to require intervention? Um, I don't know that right now, but then as we're doing budget, that's important yes, um, to plan for summer school, obviously, and to plan for if we need additional staff for intervention classes. So that, that's really the information um, that I was looking for, and so I apologize that I was not, I did not communicate that clearly, obviously. I will get that information for you, ma'am. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else have discussion? Okay, we'll move on to 6D. Discussion of current pathways for CTE uh, to include the number of CTE programs from middle school to high school. And that was also an item that I had asked for. And I know, I think, I believe everyone should have received not just 
what was in this year's course catalog for 1819, but I did ask administration to provide um, 1718 and then 1617. These are, these are pathways though and not actual courses. And again, I obviously didn't communicate clearly because I was wanting to know, did we take any courses away from any of the pathways? Are there any courses that we elimin eliminated or added? And um, that, that was really my question. Okay, uh, Ms. Lafreniere, if you could try to answer that, please. Yes, sir. Um, we actually added um, two courses at Judson Middle School, and we replaced a course at Kitty Hawk, and we replaced a course at Woodlake Hills. And the reason for that was to align our feeder pattern, because with the addition of veterans and the addition of programs there, we needed to realign the courses at middle school with their feeders. What were the ones that you added at Judson Middle School? Um, digital media and principles of health science. Digital, digital media and principles of health science? Yes, ma'am. And then you said at Cur no, at Woodlake. Kitty Hawk. Kitty Hawk and Woodlake Hills, you? Yes, ma'am. We replaced. Which means you deleted. Which courses were deleted? So the uh, principles of ag science was replaced with the principles of arts, AB, tech, and communications. And that's because it feeds the um, print services at veterans. So you deleted ag science and replaced it with arts? Yes. Oh, arts and AB. Arts and AB, then how about Woodlake Hills? Um, we deleted the principles of uh, applied engineering and replaced it with the business marketing and finance. And again, to match its feeder pattern. Yes, ma'am. Ms. Pichot. Are you done? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Lafreniere. I'd like to know, okay, so at Woodlake Hills, you removed, what class was that that you Principles said? Principles of Applied Engineering. Okay, and it will be at Metzger. It, yes, it's always been at Metzger. So, what I'd like to know is, how do you decide which one of the classes will be at the high schools? My concern is, are all of the high schools going to have um, the same number of classes? These are pathways. They're not actually classes that we're looking at. What you showed us were the pathways. What I'd like to know, well, basically what she was asking, what the classes are. So Judson High School ha will have media technology, communication, science, technology, engineering. No, ma'am. Um, no, I'm showing you which courses, courses at middle school feed which programs at the high school. So there will not be any classes at Woodlake or Metzger or Kirby or Judson Middle in digital print services because because it's at veterans. It's at veterans. Yes, ma'am. So Kitty Hawk feeds veterans. So that's why we added that class at the middle school. So the way that you do that is, like you said, whatever the feeder school is, that's the pathway that they'll have at the high school. Am I? Am kind I kind of the other way around? So we have designated programs in our high schools. Um, so I need to point out um, that we do not receive state funding for our programs at middle school. However. This district, this board, 
um, district and campus administration has been extremely supportive of CTE mm -hmm. um, continuing at our middle schools. Right. And so um, these principals classes are actually for high school credit. And so it was a way to create a pool and a pathway for students starting in the eighth grade. Um, and so uh, they get high school credit for these principals classes. And they all feed their feeder high school. Okay. And the decision as to what we have where, first of all, is determined by the feeder school, but also um, by the staff and the certifications that we have, as well as the facilities that we have. Right, because when Veterans was constructed, th there was going to be that digital uh, print at it their building. Yes, yeah. So that's why it's only at Veterans. Right. And I remember that um, cosmetology only used to be at Wagner, right? It used to be at Judson yeah. years at ago. At Judson? Yes, ma'am. And then it left? Yes. And now it's back? Yes, ma'am. OK. And what about that, um, wasn't there some type of a health care um, pathway? I, I thought I remembered dental chairs. Yes, ma'am. So we have an extensive health care program at Judson High School, including radiology, dental, nursing, um, uh, and now medical assisting. And so that's why we added the principles of health science class at Judson this year was to, um, uh, to help with the large number of students that we have entering the, um, in ninth grade. Mm -hmm. So the students can take that principal's class in eighth grade and get high school credit for it and get started on their pathway a little bit early. So now what if after they get to high school mm -hmm. and they want to take a pathway at another school, mm -hmm. they can still do that? Yes, ma'am. And are we providing the transportation? Yes, ma'am. Okay. I think that's all I have. Thank you. Okay. I think I'm good, too. I think I'm figuring it out. So if I'm at Judson Middle School and I want to be at the science, technology, the STEM mm -hmm. pathway at the high school at Wagner, I have to take digital media? For STEM, no, you would apply for the T-STEM Academy. So, okay, you can. And if I'm at Kitty Hawk and I want to be in the STEM, I can't go to STEM unless I'm in the T-STEM at Judson Middle School. STEM specifically, yes. We do have other um, engineering systems, some other engineering classes, and, and of course STEM is science, technology, engineering, and math. So. But if you're speaking specifically of STEM, yeah, it would, it would be the application. Okay. And we deleted Ag Science at Kitty Hawk. Did we not have students participating? Was that not a large participation? Um, no, it was a very low enrollment. We actually transitioned that program because, again, the feeder pattern changed from Judson to, uh, to Veterans. Ag Science, as you know, is at Judson. Um, and so it was low enrolled, but we phased it out. Um, to give those students a chance to still be able to transfer and so none of our none of our middle school students do ag. Do ag. That's correct. Yeah. Um, it also causes a bit of um, conflict because students who are in FFA um, they can only start earning their time and their scholarship time from freshmen. So if they're in right. at principles of ag science in eighth grade, it doesn't count, oh. and, and so that caused a bit of a conflict. Anybody else? Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, next we have 6E, discussion of 2018-2019 coaching assignments and athletic periods. Ms. Pichon asked for that item. Dr. Montoya, I asked for this item to be on the agenda because of the outcry that the coaches made last month mm -hmm. at our, and, and, and I was in the dark. I didn't know why all the coaches were coming. So okay. I asked for this to be on the agenda because apparently they were talking about us not changing their schedule. And I just asked for this item to be on the agenda so it could be explained, okay. please. Uh, Dr. Fields, if you want to briefly 
talk about that one? Yes, sir. Um, in an effort to prepare for the budget meeting, the cabinet has been talking about various ways to decrease the budget. And one of the options that came up was looking at the athletic periods for coaches to see if we were in line with local area uh, programs such as Northeast or Northside or East Central, or to see if we were staffing at a, at a higher level and maybe we could cut back. And then one of the recommendations that came up was maybe looking at um, decreasing the amount of athletic periods. That um, went to uh, one of the principals at the high school who then went and started a preliminary master schedule looking at to see what it would look like if you went with one athletic period for the coaches, which then caused a concern for coaches because we hadn't really advertised that that's something that we were going to do. So we had to regroup. Um, I sat and spoke with Dr. Montoya, and he made the decision that next year we would keep things the same way that they are this year. And that's what was communicated to the coaches when they came last time. But that's how that, that got out as a concern. So nothing's going to change? No, ma'am. Not for next year. Now, when we come forward, if um, there's a recommendation that's contrary to that, we would bring it to Dr. Montoya, and then we may bring something to the board that is contrary to that decision. But I've been assured by Dr. Montoya that it would stay the same thus far. Yes, ma'am. I just have a quick question. Just to the, the charts that we received, yes, those are actual number of students that each coach teaches for every period or um, is responsible for. Correct. We, we tried to. In the grade book, I'm guessing. Correct. Yes, ma'am. Okay. I just yes, wanted to verify. Yes, ma'am. Okay. We'll move on to item 6F, discussion of enrollment procedures for early college high school, JECA. Ms. Bichol. Thank you, Dr. Salinas. Um, again, I, I, I think that I miscommunicated to Dr. Cantu also. My concern last month when we were talking about this was the process of selection. And we got a lot of material, there was great material, thank you Dr. Cantu, that talked about what we got application, what the application looked like, how they recommended. But what we didn't have and what I wanted some concrete percentages on are the percentage of students that are selected that are first gen. Generation. Yes, sir. Okay. The percentage, because when this all first began, that was the impetus that we needed to reach those kids that would normally, that not, would normally be. not go to school. And so I would like for us to focus on that particular criteria and give it a percentage. Uh, Mr. LaFoyle said, you know, I don't know. I just think that the majority of the students, whatever the percentage is, the majority of the students need to be what we set out to do initially, that the majority of the students be first generational college students. And then the rest would be whatever the district comes up with and that committee comes up with, whether they're recommended by their counselors or principals from the middle schools or even their teachers. That would be another category. And there is no category of a lottery, but is a lottery a consideration? Uh, Dr. Cantu, since you've kind of researched that and looked at all the MOUs and procedures, please uh, share information. 
Dr. Montoya, in my, if I may approach the podium, I have a, a very brief uh, PowerPoint. Uh, we now have an update. We did have uh, the enrollment procedures take place today, and I'd like to just present an update. May I approach the stadium, the podium? We didn't proceed, ma'am. I'm going to ask Mr. LaFoyle to go ahead and ask his question first prior to your, you sure? Okay, thank you. Good evening, board members and Dr. Montoya. Um, what I wanted to do is, what first of all, I'd like to start by stating a little bit of, or providing some context for the administrative procedures. Um, we started discussing this information and the need to uh, make sure that we were following the TA blueprint for the early college. And so one of the things that I did, I, I worked with the JECA administration and developed administrative procedures. If you look at the, that is included in your packet. If you look at the administrative procedures on page one, number three, it outlines the actual process. But that just happened today. So I can give you an update as to what happened. As you will note, the committee members, uh, we have seven committee members. That was one of the things that this board requested, that it includes uh, personnel, not only at the campus level, but at the district level. So that included myself, the interim principal at JECA, the JECA counselor, a uh, department chair, the director of guidance and counseling, a middle school counselor, and a non-JECA parent. And the student selection process changed. Yes, ma'am. Would you go back to your first slide, please? Yes, ma'am. Where's the representation from the other middle schools? When we talked about this with the administration, we had not included any middle school representation, so we started with one middle school representation only this time. We did have the director of guidance who oversees all our counselors, so it was just a matter of keeping the number to a smaller group, seven people representing. We can continue to add and modify the group if this board wishes, but this was the initial start. Okay. So one of the important things, I'm sorry, Mr. LaFoyle, not a problem. I'm looking at the parent down there at the bottom. Does that change or does that parent stay there? That parent helped us this year. It would change for next change year. from year to year. Yes, sir. And about the middle schools, I think uh, just one is not cutting it. Okay, we can consider adding one for, yeah. are you thinking um, one for each middle school? Yes. Okay. I know it's going to get to be a lot of members there. But I think every middle school had have a chance to say their piece. Well, now, every middle school, there's a presentation at each middle school, correct, for JECA? Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Well, that's why I'm asking. I will make note of that recommendation. And what percentage are you uh, getting me disadvantaged? Let her, let her go ahead and finish. Um, let me pre present some data, because I've got a little bit of data, okay. and if I don't have it, okay. I will definitely bring it back. So one of the most important aspects that this board asked was to make sure that we adhere to the early college blueprint. And the selection of students for JECA was based on performance, such as grades, attendance, discipline referrals, et cetera. That's the way students were being selected. There was a process. However, we have moved because the blueprint calls for an open access lottery system. And I'm going to explain what that is. I've included the definition and the benchmark just as a source so that uh, it can support. And one of the, the second bullet that I'd like to draw attention to, it, it, it specifically in the blueprint talks about historically underrepresented in college courses. So that would be first generation. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. The students that are low socioeconomic status. African American, Hispanic, and Native American. So huge change with the application process. The applications were sent to the five middle schools beginning in November and collected in February. All completed applications were accepted. We had equitable middle school representation based on the total current eighth grade enrollment. That's also outlined in our um, administrative procedures. The applications were coded we did not see any names of any students. So for example, if a student it was from Kirby, it was K1, and we continued to number 20 or 25. If it was Metzger, similar pattern. So you get the gist of the intent was, it was uh, blind selection. Committee responsibilities. This committee came together today 
and we looked at the data. We verified each student at each middle school. We made sure that the students met at-risk criteria, and we prioritized three categories. The first one that the state says we must adhere to, which is at risk. The second was economically disadvantaged. And the third priority was males, because we have a, a, a lower number of representation in the male students. We also used technology to come up with a random selection formula. So we um, used Excel. And those of you that might have a little bit more knowledge than I do in that formula, it was created so that if it randomized the numbers and so that we didn't know the students, we, did, we were using student numbers. A total of 150 students were selected. 130 is what we call for primary selection. These are the students that will be admitted as a cohort of 130. However, every year we have students that for whatever reason, they move, they're in the military, they, uh, we select alternates. So we got four alternates from each middle school of five, so that would be the 20. So once this was completed today, uh, we're looking at so, um, mailing out the selection letters to the campuses to inform the parents and the students. We're also going to continue to attend. There's an event coming up that's being organized by the Guidance and Counseling Department, and we're calling it the four-year graduation plan and career pathway discussion. JECA will be there and will be sharing information with the students and parents that have uh, been selected to participate in this program. There are some general requirements. We're asking that the parents attend the orientation, uh, an orientation session on April the 7th. The reason for that is we're going to discuss degree plans and the rigor that is involved when you sign up for JECA. There will be a, what we call a JECA compact, and also the, any student or parent that doesn't attend or they don't have the compact or that agreement, then they will be withdrawn because we want them to understand that there are some serious commitments to this, uh, to JECA. So in summary, the student selection process, we have 100% adherence and alignment to the TEA Early College Blueprint Benchmark 1. We've established a repeatable process. It's an administrative procedure now so that we can be consistent and we can be fair as we move forward. We have used the at-risk criteria to make sure that it mirrors the district demographic data. And as of right now, this is something you were asking about, 80% are first-generation college goers of this new cohort that has been selected today. The committee includes representatives from district campus level and a parent. And I want you to know that this committee worked very hard today, um, and we adhere to the recommendations by the Texas Education Agency assigned coach, Dr. Stotts. And we do have several committee members that are in attendance, and I would like to ask them to stand up and be recognized. They worked very hard today. We've got several committee, if you serve on the lottery committee. Thank you very much for the hard work today. And I would be happy to entertain any other questions. Well, thank you, Dr. Cantu, for your presentation. Thank you to your committee, your staff, those of you that also worked on this. Uh, I'm glad to see that 80%. Um, so the other percentage, the other 20%, is going to be following that TEA criteria? Yes, ma'am, because they are still meeting the at-risk or eco-disc criteria. And um, one more thing. You said that the male population was underutilized. Is that a TEA? Um, was that an observation by TEA or by Judson? Our coach helped review the data with us. And what, when she was, we were looking at the data, we saw that there was the male, number of male students in Jekyll was slightly lower than the females. She encouraged us to use that as an indicator to see if we could increase the number of male students. So uh, the preliminary selection letters you've already done for next year, and they will be going out. They will be going out pretty quickly. The committee yeah. just met today, mm -hmm. and they will be going out in the next couple of weeks. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Cantu. You're welcome, ma'am. Mr. LaFoyle. Thank you. I just don't want it to go back like it went the last few years. They, they lost sight of what we put that in there for. 
I was on the board when it originally started up, and we passed the bond and everything else to get the school out there. I don't want to see it slip back again. And I got two more years on this board. Thank you. You're welcome. Ms. Knoyer. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Cantu and your committee for all the hard work. I'm very encouraged and excited for our first generation college students, our at-risk students, to have this opportunity um, to get the college credit, to graduate with a uh, community college degree, and I'm very excited about the direction we're heading. Thank you again for all your hard work. Thank you, ma'am. Can I get a copy of this uh, presentation? Absolutely, sir. I'll make sure I give it to Ms. Holmes so she can distribute it to everyone. Welcome. If there's, if there's no further discussion, we'll move on to item 6G, update on statement of impact amendment by the following schools, Jubilee Academy, IDEA Public Schools, School of Science and Technology. Just uh, members of the board, very briefly, this is something we get uh, almost every month. These are charter private type schools that are opening up literally all, all over Baird County and Travis County, Austin area. And we get from TEA, the state, uh, statements basically saying what's going to be the impact. We fill them out. We mail them to TEA in Austin. I think they file them in a file where they get lost and nobody looks at them after that. But we do our half that's required and that's it. <laughs> yeah, I agree. It may be a corner circular file. I don't know, but... Hey, thank you. We'll Dr. Salinas. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. I have a comment. Last month, we had this item on the agenda for uh, charter schools that were moving into the area, and I requested that we devise some sort of plan to uh, get the message out in the areas that may be impacted that uh, showcase what Judson ISD can do. So have we moved at that on that in any way? Because I really think this is an opportunity for us to, to get in front of this. We have asked uh, Mr. Macias and members of the board, actually at a principal's meeting probably a couple of months ago, we did ask our principals to create informational packets and share with their community what successes are occurring on their campuses, either with students, staff, or activities. And in all honesty, I think we had several principals that did do that, but we have others that we're going to have to uh, prod a little bit more to have them get the information out. And it could be, it could be in a website, it can be a pamphlet, it could be meetings for the community, you know, just different formats. But it was brought up, and, and, and we're still pursuing that, that whole process. Well, that I do appreciate. I, I just would encourage uh, us to ensure we develop a plan so that we can say in response to these new um, um, charter schools that may be moving into the area that we would like to address that community forums are perfect at our campuses we need to just tell our story and so that's how we we start to eliminate uh, some of these issues thank you we'll move on to item 6h update on board advisory committees does anybody have any updates miss knoyer um, I'm on two advisory committees, um, and they both met this last week. Um, the finance committee meeting was very short and sweet and um, has to do with budgeting, of course. The, um, however, the curriculum committee um, takes a little longer, and I, I just want to say that I really appreciate Ms. Davis's lead in that committee um, and all the members who are participating. It's extremely productive to have all these wonderful minds together looking at what are the areas of concern? And um, our charge has been to not only present a problem, but to brainstorm solutions. And so we're moving forward with what does curriculum look like? What professional development is gonna need to happen in order to make sure that we're implementing that curriculum? And I'm just extremely excited as a curriculum person at heart to see how, how forward we're moving. And again, thank you to all of you. I know there are a number of you in the room who were there um, Monday night and, and previously. Um, this is not a one and done thing. It's ongoing, of course, and um, it's a lot of hard work, but I, I feel excited about the progress we're making. Thank you. Yes, Ms. Rodriguez. 
Um, so I'm part of the strategic planning committee and we met um, earlier this month before spring break and um, we are in the middle of conducting a landscape analysis to understand um, what is going on across the district in order to um, be able to identify issues, opportunities, um, and uh, make some suggestions that are in line with the vision for the, the district. Thank you. There's no further discussion. We'll proceed to 6I. Update on board training, conferences, events, and consider future agenda item requests by board members. We'll start with Mr. LaFoyle. Thank you. Ms. Knoyer. I feel like I'm bragging, but <laughs> um, I, attended, I attended the TASB conference in Galveston along with um, Ms. Bichelle and uh, Ms. Eaton. And I think we were all very inspired um, by the conference because one of the primary threads was having student voices. And I think we're all seeing some wonderful student leaders emerging throughout the country, um, but they're also emerging in Texas and also in our district. And so to hear the concerns and the solutions presented by students was very powerful. Um, I had several ideas that I came back with and I've already spoken um, about one of them with, with, a, with someone and um, hopefully we're gonna continue to move in a wonderful direction. Thank you. Mr. Macias. Yes, uh, there are two events that I attended recently that I was real proud of. Um, when it, you work in the community, you, you uh, have an opportunity to, to meet a lot of people. So I attended a luncheon, actually, a half-day conference at the Witte Museum a couple of weeks ago. And uh, you had about 700 educators and board members from across the city assemble to talk about uh, pre-K. That was one of the topics. And when I get there, I hear this beautiful sound. I'm like, well, you know, it's, it was actually Miss Anderson, Bonnie Anderson's Marama group. And um, it was phenomenal. So although Judson um, formally wasn't there, I was there as a board member, they were recognized immediately. And so to be recognized by the community at an event like that was is awesome. And so I just want to encourage Dr. Matoy, anytime we have an opportunity to represent ourselves in the community, that is very important. And so I, I just wanted to brag on them. They, they were the hit of the, sh of, of the whole event and uh, something to be really proud of. Um, the other thing is I had an opportunity, a great opportunity to speak on a panel about uh, student safety and campus safety a few weeks ago. It was actually the third time I've had the opportunity to talk about uh, such topics. And in the wake of the school shootings, and it is really an issue that's on top of mind for a lot of individuals. So it's nice to work with the community in terms of trying to address um, areas of concern and how we will move together as a community. Judson is great, but we're not alone, and we're not on an island. So moving together with the community is phenomenal. So great stuff. Thank you. Ms. Rodriguez. Um, I am going to be attending the National Association of School Boards uh, conference um, that's in uh, April, and it's taking place here in San Antonio. Thank you. Ms. Bichelle. Like uh, Ms. Kenoya, we had a great time at that uh, conference in Galveston, and the most, Im the most uh, um, impressive part of it were the student voices. There, there was nothing better than listening and watching and having students conduct those classes that we attended and telling us what we need to do for them. It was great. Thank you. I'll be attending um, UTSA next week. They're having a leadership conference, so I will be attending that. And just so important as a board member and working with administration, it's really important to, to know that we as a board cannot make good decisions if we don't have good information. Mm -hmm. And good information means we're being transparent um, and we're providing the entire scope of the information, not just a narrow focus. And so I want to encourage that we continue to do that and I will make sure that as we put future agenda items um, I will be more clear not just with the agenda language but with the expectation so that we don't have um, you know employees spending numerous hours on data that's great but that maybe that's not what we wanted so I will do a better job of that and also just also ask my colleagues if they do put an agenda item I will call to clarify um, so that we can get to the specifics of what exactly um, are we asking for so that's all I have. 
And Dr. Dr. Salinas? Yes. I also want to echo that I'll be at the same conference Ms. Rodriguez will be. It'll be my third time attending the National School Board Association Conference. Fantastic. One of the best conferences ever. Okay. We will move now to... Oh, I have to read. <sighs> The board will now adjourn into closed session pursuant to the following sections of the Texas Open Meetings Act. 551.074, discussing personnel. 551.071, attorney consultation regarding legal issues related to possible agreement with the district's chief financial officer. Um, C. 7C, pursuant to Texas Government Code Section 551.074, discussion regarding possible agreement with the district's chief financial officer. D, pursuant to section 551.071 of the Texas Government Code, attorney consultation regarding legal and procedural issues related to the possible agreement for Judson Early College Academy principal. E, pursuant to section 551.074 of the Texas Government Code, consider and take possible action, consider and take possible Wait, consider and discuss possible agreements, excuse me, for Judson Early College Academy principal. F, pursuant to section 551.071 of the Texas Government Code, attorney consultation regarding legal and procedural issues related to proposed non-renewal of the term contract of Judson Early College Academy principal. <coughs> G, pursuant to sections 551.074 of the Texas Government Code, consider and discuss the proposed non-renewal of the term contract of Judson Early College Academy principal. H, pursuant to section 551.074 of the Texas Government Code, discussion regarding board members' duties, roles, and responsibilities. And the time is 8.56.